Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Jonathan. And uh, today we have the honor of having Eric Rhodes, the trash art historian in the house. We're going to be talking about trash art. We're going to be talking about a lot of different things in the NFT space and the blockchain space. I'm so excited to have him as a guest. Uh, let's get right into it. If you don't know Eric, uh, he created Unofficial Punks. Uh, he also, as I said, is part of the trash art movement. And we are going to get into what that actually means. So, hey, Eric, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Good to see you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, everybody should understand that uh, Eric and I live fairly close and so we do see each other quite often. We, we are, do, yeah. We are sushi brothers. We are. <laughs> <laughs> But this is actually going to be the first time in all of our conversations and all of our meetings, this is actually the first time that we're going to be talking about the art that you create and the movement that you're involved in. So I'm really excited for this. So tell us a little bit about, first of all, you got your start in NFT, in, in blockchain really, in 2018. Prior to that, you were working for Twitter. Is that is that right? That's right. Yeah, I was I was. Uh on the global support customer experience team, the team that handles like all of the requests that you would send in for abuse or, you know, shit like beheadings and things like that, that would all go through this whole team that I was on. And I was brought in to work on some change management uh, to bring basically the service design to their, to their service. Uh, to change the way that they interacted with customers. That was in 18, 2018. So that sounds like it's more business oriented than actually art oriented. Yeah, most, well, it's design oriented, right? Um, so I've got my, I got my career started in uh, website design and development, and then it's evolved since, but it was always in the design realm so designing customer experiences designing hardware experiences designing user interfaces but there was an evolution it went from like website to like graphic design to web design to user experience design to customer service design to customer experience design you know there was a whole evolution but so taking those principles of user experience design and and bringing them into sort of the macro world of what a service would look like at scale across the whole entire product ecosystem at say Twitter or Google. How long were you there for? At Twitter, eight, 18 months, no, two years, two years. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, in a very short amount of time, you kind of gained this, you know, ramp up skill. That's amazing. Yeah, um, I had really great mentors at Google when I was working at Google. Uh, and then the guy, this dude, Donald Hicks, he brought me in at Twitter um, and uh, was just really instrumental in helping me grow in the tech space. I spent 10 years of book publishing before that. So my experience is quite varied. You know, I was working in the tech side of book publishing, but it's a notoriously slow to grow and adopt technology space. Interesting. And then I jumped to like Google and Twitter where, and I was working at this sort of innovation arm at Twitter called ATAP, Advanced Technologies and Product Projects. Oh, wow. And they were, they were the DARPA group within Google. Oh, that's super cool. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. Wow. I worked on some, a lot of, a lot of products that never saw the light of day. Yeah. Well, that's frustrating. Yeah. Well, no, that was their intention. It was to, oh. it wasn't to make a product that, that uh, was, was financially viable, was to push the boundaries in product development. Interesting. And then if something came out of that, they would adopt it to their, you know, to Nest or uh, their pre existing product, hardware products. Was it a fun place to work? Was it a happy place? Yeah, totally. It was a skunk works. It was a place where you got to experiment and try new ideas. So yeah, it was totally, it was exactly where I wanted to be. And then when I went to Twitter, it was the exact opposite. Well, wait, wait, wait. Oh, so oh, I'm sorry. So so wait, so so at you're saying at Google, it was a fun place to work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Google was a great place. Yeah. But, but then when you went to Twitter, it was a nightmare? Completely different mindset. 
right? Oh, oh, oh. They're uh, they're revenue revenue based, revenue driven, um, and uh, my ADD didn't really work with their it's the way just... that they um, wanted to do things. So it's fine, you know. I found my really? way out of it. Did Twitter help you understand? where and what was happening in the blockchain space because getting into no. 2018 okay so how did you how did you get into the space yeah so i uh totally by happenstance sort of so i've been i've been aware of blockchain uh, technology and cryptocurrencies since 2013 um as somebody who is interested in tech in general it was prudent of me to continue to learn about what are you know, these it, these you know uh incoming technologies right um so it was just sort of like i have a natural want to learn new things and because of that i was aware of it and then around 2017 i felt comfortable enough uh with understanding what blockchain was to invest in bitcoin invest in ethereum um and wow. i was and at that point so you got to figure i didn't start working in tech until 2015 okay. so um, I wasn't around people who were like actively investing in technology. And then when I got around people who were actively investing in technology, it's and you're learning and, and talking and, and hanging out with them, your knowledge speeds up. Yeah. And so I got ramped up pretty quickly on what I wanted to invest in. And then so that's sort of like my introduction to blockchain. And then after that, in 2018, I happened to be on twitter i was in i had i had been in sort of involved in the chain link community a little bit you know a, i was a link marine uh -huh. um you know pre main net kind of stuff you know just doing throwing around memes and things of that nature and just having fun with a group of people and i typed in because i've been an artist my entire life uh, but it was always as a hobby mm. and i just typed in like i wanted to see if pe what people were doing with art around crypto so I literally typed in crypto space art into twitter and i fell down this giant rabbit hole and i haven't left and i've just been falling and falling and falling and it's been getting greater and greater and greater yeah it's amazing you know i'll tell you you know just you know being your friend and kind of going to lunches and just chatting about life i didn't really understand the scope of your artwork that it really goes from the trash art and the uh, and the unofficial punks and the mm -hmm. the second uh, second realm stuff. It's extensive and it's expansive. the The amount of artwork that you've produced over the last, I guess, three or four years is incredible and it's diverse. We're going to take a little look at that at you yeah. know soon. But it's, so really I, it's been mostly over the last three years, and I didn't. My Genesis Mint was on Super Rare in two thousand. July of 2019, but I got accepted onto the platform in April of 2019 after sort of watching the space for six months. So I, f I discovered I discover this NFT world that was just crypto art at the time. Like, I didn't even know what NFT meant. I had no idea what non-fungible token was. Um, you know, I, had an, I, I, didn't, I didn't know the difference between fungible and non-fungible. I knew it was a blockchain token. Right. Uh, but you learn really quickly once you're sort of in in the world. And then so but I spent six months just watching, observing and, and seeing people like Coldy and Josie and uh, Rob Ness and uh, uh, Matt Kane and Trevor Jones, all these really early and the Pepe crew. Not, you, you know, it took me two years after that to learn why why Pepe was so important. Like I was not steeped at all into meme culture. Um, you know, I, I came from book world and traditional tech world. In, yeah, in Silicon Valley, but at this point, it's sort of like you're so mainstream at Twitter. You know, uh, it's you're not really talk thinking about advancing technology. It's sort of just thinking about making revenue. But anyway, I started to sort of play learn in, in this world, and then finally. I got the um, confidence, really, to put my art out there. You know, I had never practiced in public. I call it practicing in public now. But for a long time, my art was sort of some, like this thing I did on the side for me. I didn't make any money. I didn't have clients. It wasn't like that. 
Um, I applied a super uh, super rare. I'm 99% sure the only reason I got in is because I was an employee at Twitter and that looked good. Uh, but I used it to my advantage, so and, right. you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and there was no, vi- I didn't have to submit a video. The team was really small. The 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 community, the active community at, in this, maybe two thousand people, maybe. Right. Right. Very small. Right. Um, and so it was like this little community, and I just, uh, but I waited. I got accepted in April and I waited all the way to June to mint because I still didn't know what minting was. I was like, right. what does it mean putting stuff on the blockchain? Like I had no fucking clue. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I end up there's learning on the job. Th- there's definitely a six month ramp up. Right. So, Easily. you know, as soon as I as soon as people sold that 69 million, I turned mm-hmm. my head, you know, moved away from the physical artwork, focused on the NFTs and really spent the next six months learning. Not producing anything, not you know working with anyone, not doing anything, just learning and learning and learning. I would literally get up five thirty in the morning and start watching YouTube videos and just learning about what everything is. Getting onto Twitter, following the right people, all that stuff. You know, right now, especially like during the tail end of the boom, you know this this last kind of cycle that we've had in, in a bull market prior to the bear market that we're in now. Uh, you know, so many people would just jump on non-educated, not understanding what really was going on and just lose all of their money. And it's just, you know, it, you need to, I mean, those are kind of the gamblers, right? The, you know, we always talk about like the NFT gamble, but if you're not gambling and you're doing things educatedly, you know, educatedly, mm-hmm. which isn't the word, uh, you know, but you know, you're, you're kind of understanding where everything is now, of course, I mean, that meant that I, you know, missed the Board Ape Yacht Club and I missed the Crypto Kitties and I missed the, you know, punks and all that. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I bought the stuff that I liked, right? I'm happy with the investments that I've made. Um, I sold one piece finally that was just a duplicate of something that I had with somebody else's event, somebody else's uh, project. And that really is the limit. Everything to me is art. So I'm going to hold on to it for as long as I possibly can because it's going to go up in a frame and it's going to, you know, maybe I'll resell it in a gallery or something like that and that kind of stuff. But let's get into kind of like what happened with trash art because my understanding in my research is that, you know, Robness kind of was the 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 center impact, right? He got the a catalyst, yeah. He got a suspension from Super Rare in 2020. Mm-hmm. His work was called 64 Gallon Totter, and it was a modified reimagined stock image pulled from the Home Depot website. It's appropriation art, yeah. Well, you know, let's talk about appropriation art because mm-hmm. legally, as an artist, and I have a degree in art, you know, you are allowed to change any image 10%. And it is then redefined as a new image, mm-hmm. right? If you took the Mona Lisa and you put a mustache on the Mona Lisa, you know, that technically, if you brought it in front of a court of law, is a different Mona Lisa than the one is that, that that's at the loop. Well, the, uh, but the Mona Lisa is, uh, in, is basically CCO now. CCO is? Um, Creative Commons Zero, so basically in the public domain. Right, because right. It, its copyright is is passed. Right, right, right. But but but, but anything the, le- sure. the legal the legal yeah. form of art is changing it by ten percent. And I looked at the Robness NFT, yeah. and that was changed way more. There was no indication 100%. that it was a Home Depot piece of piece of you know garbage trash mm-hmm. bin. Uh, you know, I don't even know. I guess in England, maybe they call it a garbage bin. A totter is is that is that why the word totter is used? Uh, the the totter is or totter. I don't know. I don't know how you say it, but um, I've been I've been saying it totter, but it's the uh, it's the brand name of the garbage bin uh, company, uh, uh, and the company is totter totter LLC is the is the company who. Uh, uh, created yeah. that it's sort of like if rubber made had a wheelie bin you know that right. looked similar to it right it would be the rubber made wheelie bin okay or xerox making a machine is called a xerox it's a xerox machine right exactly so there is there is some like 
um there is some what do they call it um genericide here okay. so basically xerox no longer can claim copyright because right. it's in the a lot of people have been using xerox to right. make copies for a long time it's in yeah. it's in the nomenclature it's out there in the world yeah. there's something called genericide uh, as my buddy colin would would say so there is, there might be a claim for toter as people use toter for garbage cans right um that it that it is generous but we're sort of jumping ahead to um, something that's happening today what i'd like to do is give a little context about about robness and the toter and and, yes. and how all that how all that happened yeah, and i think it's important to know before you were talking about um sort of people who are losing money when we came into the space we we're getting excited about five dollar sales and I'll never forget Rob Ness made the highest purchase on Super Rare uh, all time at one point. It was for a thousand dollars. Wow. Right? Like we're not we're not and this this is like I think it was in 2020 when he did that. So it it had been two years where it wasn't about making money, it was sort of just about proving at scale that that art on the blockchain can be, you know, can be a thing. Right. Uh, and we did that. And then it became about money after people and all that kind of good stuff. Um, hey, you know, all, all the power to all the artists that could do that. I've got, you know, I've made great money in this space. Um, but in the beginning, it wasn't about that. In the beginning, it was about these ethos, this ethos of decentralization, this ethos of uh, breaking down, breaking away from the traditional art world, which is typically gatekept by, by galleries. And um, the market itself is is manipulated right so we were challenging all of these concepts as not just trash artists trash art didn't exist yet it was all of crypto art were challenge was challenging these these concepts but as more money comes in right and more investors come in and people are concerned about their bags and at the time super rare was considered a premier or is considered one of the premier platforms there were whales as collectors that were influencing the leadership by threatening to pull their money if they didn't pull art off the platform and artists off the platform that they didn't think their art was devaluing the art that they had already invested in. That's why Rob Ness and Max Osiris were ultimately pulled off. And it was sure. the cat, the catalyst is Rob Ness and Max. Because okay. these two were sort of like, I guess you can consider it like Warhol and Basquiat, right? Like they're okay. two people who are challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. They're working as a, a team or, or, you know, or compatriots or, you know, together. And, um, and these whales just didn't like the kind of work that they were minting. And they threatened the leadership team, John Crane and Zach and everybody at Super Rare to pull their money and go someplace else. And... Yeah. I had been told privately and then made it public that their customer is the collector, not the artist. Artists are easy to come by, is what I was told. And so we have to listen to our collectors. Uh, and ultimately, they made the excuse that it was, an, it was a copyright-protected image, uh, and that was the reason that they were kicking Mac, uh, Rob Ness off. For for Max, it was a similar reason, but I think it was he was he was remixing, and at the time, remixing was like a no no, hmm. right? Like remix culture is such a part of NFTs now. You see yeah. all the derivative. Oh, yeah. We remix culture in 2019 did not exist. In 2020, did not exist. Uh, in fact, you were denigrated if you remixed another artwork. Interesting. Which is where, like, the core of trash art begins. Yeah. You know, because there's... Now, now we have, you know, Bored Ape Yacht Club, and we have... Cake uh, apes, and, you know, flipped mutant, you know, alien apes, and who the right. fuck knows. It's right. all It's derivatives galore. So that could have never happened on a super rare. That's That happened on OpenSea, because they really don't have the capacity due to the fact that they don't have the number of employees that they need because they haven't hired the right number of people to kind of monitor the art and the, and the projects that are going up on open sea. Well, you know, anyone can put up anything on open sea and yeah. until somebody, until a group of people actually yell about it, mm -hmm. open sea isn't going to do anything about it. 
Well, yeah, and and you know, at the time it was a gated, well, it still is a gated platform. So super there rare. was super rare. And wow. so there was a very small like that that was how they controlled what was minted on their platform. Do you think that they lost out during the bull run because they weren't able, they, they did very well during the bull run? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, and artists on that platform did very well. It's still considered a premier you know, before Nifty Gateway came around, it was the premier platform. Interesting. You know, and it's where X copy, where you get all the good X copy stuff. It's where you get all the good Matt Cain stuff and Trevor Jones. You know, that would really require you to be somewhere in the art, the fine art NFT world, right? Not the PFP and project, you know, uh, um, utility and and all this stuff, right? You're purely buying artwork, on but Super none of the None of that existed in, in 2020, and that's where trash art began, right? Trash mm -hmm. art, um, and, and really, one of one art was the market, except for except for CryptoPunks and Crypto Skulls and a couple of other projects. The PFP renaissance didn't happen until after, after January of 2021. You've been quoted as saying the trash art movement began with a conversation about what defines art, the role of curation on-chain, and the role mm -hmm. technology plays in the creation of art. Mm -hmm. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I, first, I think, I, you know, I basically what I believe is that trash art sort of plants a flag in between, uh, in the middle of the question of what is and what isn't art, okay. and basically says you don't get to define what art is. Right. So trash art is has become a philosophy of individual creativity where this idea that um, someone out there gets to tell you that your art is or isn't good or is art or doesn't belong on this platform is is what decentralization is all about. This idea of individual sovereignty, individual creativity, individual ownership over your brand at the time in 2020. Um, there were people attempting to control what was what they considered to be good art and trash art. The movement is born out of that. So in 2020, Rob Ness got kicked off. Max Osiris got kicked off of Super Rare, and I got kicked off later in the year in Super Rare, all for remixing artwork. Was your remix the unofficial punks? No, no, no. My remix never made it to the platform because I oh. threatened to remix one of their popular artists, Hakatau. The leadership team, specifically John Crane, saw my tweet, and the next morning I received an email saying that I was removed from Super Rare. So based on the threat, just threat. the tweet, you were yes. removed from Super Rare. 100%. Basically from February 2020 to September of 2020, there grew this movement of artists in support of Rob Ness and Max, and I was one of those. And um, we began to move everything over to Rarible. At the time, Rarible wasn't considered a great place to mint art. A lot of scammy stuff was there. And we moved an entire culture of artists and onboarded an entire culture of artists onto that platform, making it viable enough that people started coming to Rarible, popular artists started coming to Rarible because they saw the viability of the marketplace itself. Wow. And Rarible was, at the time, um, an open marketplace for artists. And it still is open, but OpenSea was a little bit harder to use than Rarible at the time. So we sort of shifted to, to Rarible. And that's, so the culture of trash art began to build there. And we began to hang out together online, you know, and don't forget this is mid pandemic, right? So a lot of us are in front of our computers. I'm having phone call, well, phone calls. I'm having zoom calls with people I've never met before that are now some of my closest friends. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and we sort of developed this culture, this, this subculture, this punk art, this punk rock art group. It doesn't have a leader. It's amorphous and it, and evolves. And what began as, sort of this ownership of the term trash art because what happened was at the time in 2020 somebody called where they were calling our artwork trash we and just like the impressionists we decided we're going to own the word because impressionism was used to denigrate the impressionists in a in a by a popular critic at the time um 
And same thing for us. A, a well-known influencer you called our work trash art on public, and, you know, on Twitter, and we we owned it. We said, you're going to call our work trash art? We're going to be trash artists. And the memes of the toter started growing, and trash art sort of evolved into sort of three prongs. You had the, the meme, you had the aesthetic, the use of the Photoshop, uh, and uh, photo mosh, and, and glitching, and low effort art, right? That's sort of the aesthetic of it. And then there was the movement itself, which was the focus on decentralization of art and, and e you know, the Web3 ethos and, and individual sovereignty and trying to get artists to consider creating their own contracts and not relying on platforms to, um, to control how, what art we can put on the platform, you know, or, or put out there. So th for many years, that was sort of the three prongs. And then recently... And sort of come back to the old individual, like in philosophy of individual creativity. I always think of the double diamond in design, uh -huh. where it expands and then contracts and then it expands again as we learn more. We're sort of in the contraction phase of it all, where where more people are coming into the space and the meme, the the Toter meme is really driving a lot of the discussion. But what's important too is we're pushing the boundaries of copyright and ip we're pushing the boundaries of what gatekeeping looks like we're challenging the status quo that the traditional art world um has set set for us for a long time <clears throat> market pricing influence who gets to make money who doesn't right the movement's growing again uh and it's growing on tezos which is really beautiful there's oh, a yeah, there's a, there's an entire culture of because one of the one of the things that, that 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 is really difficult about making art on Ethereum today is gas price can be high, oh, the cost of entry is high. When when I started in in eighteen and nineteen, uh, there were times I was minting for point zero 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 one cent. Yeah, right. Gas was super and low. Um, so now Tezos offers the opportunity to do that. And what happens is when your when your cost of entry is so low, experimentation continues to sort of grow at a rapid rate. And so the kind of experimentation we were doing in the early days of trash art were now are happening again on Tezos. Oh, wow. And it's really beautiful to see. Yeah, if anybody wants to see what's happening on, just follow hashtag Tez T E Z trash. And you'll see all of that, all of all of the great stuff that's going on there. And let's talk about this for a second, because <laughs> we're looking at the people's potatoes, the wash trading, rary, and the weeds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what 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 should we know about these pieces? I mean, the people's potato. You and I have have talked a little bit about what that yeah. is. Yeah. So the people's potato is a fungible, non fungible token. A fungible, um, non fungible token. Yeah, I minted one billion of them. So basically, okay. I created a pseudo currency via an NFT image. And and this is people can just pick this up. Is this available for people? Yeah, it's available. Yeah, uh, but you know, the whole idea behind it was to mint something that would always be cheap, and it was made in the in the in the vein of low effort trash art. the The image itself is a is one click photo moshed. One, what does that mean? One click photo moshed. So photo mosh is a software. Um, th think of it as a synthesizer for your images, and it lets you do all kinds of crazy effects to images. You can oh. also automate it by hitting the the mosh button, and it will it will randomize from that from their list of features. And I did that with this. Uh, with one click and just minted it. And here we have it. There are 718 owners. There is, what is that? 1 million or 100 million? Uh, yeah, one, so 1 billion. 1 billion. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and um, and this, this particular piece uh, was shortlisted for the most innovative NFT in 2020 by okay. NFT Awards. And it ultimately, it eventually won the uh, the People's Choice Award. I want to talk about the unofficial punks. The unofficial punks is directly related to my experience in trash art, uh, specifically remix culture and appropriation art. It looks like a punks style piece. It's a hundred. It's a hundred percent borrowed. It's an homage, a uh, derivative project of the CryptoPunks. It's 24 by 24 pixels. It's built on top of pre-existing punk 
visuals. Sometimes I created new stuff, but ultimately the images are are derivative of CryptoPunks. This all happened organically. So you see that little guy in the middle? That I'm wearing a hat right here. Um, uh -huh. I created this piece because at the time I did not own a punk. I'd missed out on buying punks. I thought punks were not cool. I didn't understand. I was so, so when I started in this space, I was so caught up in the art of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't understand the com the community aspect of like owning owning a collectible that other people and and then you know connecting socially with other people who also own those collectibles i was so focused on just trying to be an artist in the space that wasn't focused on the collectible aspects of it all and so i missed i missed on crypto punks and then there were a couple of one million dollar sales and you know the floor had jumped tremendously and so i wanted my own punk and so i created my own punk and i saw i was inspired by money a lot by a lot of money um he's no longer with us but he's he's one of these one of the earliest innovators in the crypto art space you know you could look him up money a lot of is his is his twitter handle and so he created his own version of a crypto punk using his aesthetic and i was inspired by that to create mine and then um i just shared it and i think because of the people that i hung around in the space the people who were naturally inclined and interested in meme culture, interested in remixing, interested in appropriation art. Um, that one tweet basically inspired an entire culture uh, and an, an entire alt punk movement because of this project right here. There were, I think I did some early, I, I collected data on this at the time. So this is, and, and for context, for people who don't know, this is all before apes before apes there were very few pfp projects that people were putting in their profile pictures punks was one of them crypto skulls wasn't really there yet i think some people were using the kitties whatever the and, and the axie infinities and things of like things of that nature oh and avastars right okay so maybe there was some but it wasn't like major it wasn't the idea of the pfp wasn't wasn't like totally culturally significant in nfts quite yet right, right. and then unofficial punks and ultimately alt punks and the entire community um that that came that was born out of this which included like 160 sub we call those sub genres but other artists that were creating other punk inspired derivatives mm -hmm. um, it became a cultural a social and cultural movement of people experimenting with the punk aesthetic the idea of remix culture being reaccepted again in the art experience you know and we i call it remix because i think it's more akin to sort of how you remix and sample things in 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 rap music and 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 you know today's pop music too that was that's widely known and accepted in that in sort of in sort of the music world um artists at the time in nft space were and the collectors themselves were completely against remixing um they found especially punk owners cri original crypto punk owners found our remixes offensive um tried to get them removed um once again we're battling uphill on the same principles uh we were battling with super rare Right, except we're battling against a a much broader community of influencers now, uh, the crypto punks. the 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 saving grace here was I had some support from the crypto punks team, um, John and Matt. Oh wow! They gave the okay for my project. Oh wow! Yeah. So that's yeah. how it how it stays up and and isn't pulled down and and. Uh, yeah, for a couple, and why it's also checkmarked. I was grandfathered in on Open on OpenSea. Today, OpenSea has a internal policy where a derivative project cannot receive a checkmark. Oh, um, but they have something called a safe list. So, any new project, if you've ever bought anything on OpenSea, you'll see the meter, and it's like this is trusted or not trusted. Right. It wants you to be aware that you may be purchasing a fraudulent something. Right. You know, or so there. What they did, what they did was they added this extra layer of friction, and then when your project, 
becomes popular, they remove that layer of friction, and that's how they get you on the safe list, but you can't receive a blue check mark. I am one of the few derivative projects out there uh, at Unofficial Punks that has a check mark um, because I was grandfathered in. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. That puts so much value to that that whole project. That's incredible. It does, yeah, and really to the to the whole community. There's like there are there's an entire community of of uh alt punks that exist today, like death punks. If we look at fast food punks, um, all of these these widely accepted derivatives uh in my opinion would not exist today had it not ha had not had the unofficial punks not not created this sort of excitement so and this again i i keep having i want to repeat this it was two months before apes even hit the market apes shifted the paradigm right 100 right. no doubt right. absolutely but the catalyst for that shift and getting people interested in and the idea of the remix happened in the all punk movement in those two months between february and april before apes drop i i will take this to my grave 100 percent believe the unofficial punks are 100 percent responsible for that but it gets overshadowed unfortunately it gets overshadowed because of how innovative the apes were you know and 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 i'm okay with that you know because the people who know if you know you know Right. And the people who know know, and that's fine with me. But Apes absolutely shifted the paradigm. And another project I missed out on because I was like, the art is crap. Not that the art is crap, but I was just like, it's the same thing. Oh, ape, 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 ape. You know, I was, I just didn't get it. I didn't get being part of, you know. Um, and and is the unofficial punks are they hand drawn or are they computer generated? No, I I hand created them. That's each, amazing. Each and every a hundred. There's a hundred of them. And I went down to the pixel level and customized each one, and then you blow it up. I'm not a 10,000 PFP. I don't have, didn't have millions of dollars to create a community with, so I had to, you know, just work on creating my smaller community through art. And I think that's a That's one of the challenges that artists have is when you're competing against big brands like like board apes and also bigger brands as artists like ferocious or yeah. x copy who have very distinct styles yeah. it could be a challenge what nfts have done isn't changed the top of the market though i think that that's what people wanted to happen i think the top of the market still acts like the traditional art world there are people who can influence who 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 are the popular artists all that kind of you know what the market values of these artists are where if you buy it at a certain gallery it's worth more but in my opinion it did raise the floor significantly right so more artists can make a living yep. even as a hobby than ever before in a community and compete in the same marketplace as the big boys right. and right? also you know we have to remember that this is such new technology you know, mm. even you being involved in 2018, and here we are in 2022, you know, that's that's not even a 10-year art span, right? Not even and close. Art spans are really, you know, over, you know, decades, right? You look at all these movements, they take, you know, 10 years, you know, look, they take 10 years just to get into the Whitney, right? So let's see... Right. When a, a board ape yacht, I mean, I understand that they're sold at Christie's and they're sold at Sotheby's. There's a difference between being sold at an auction house and being included in the Whitney Biennial, right? right. Let me right. see when when the when the board ape yacht club gets yeah. into the Whitney Biennial, then we'll have a conversation about the art. Yeah, and you know, I think because they're so culturally significant, them and and. And uh, the crypto punks, I think they will at some point. It's well, like, well, you know, you know how I feel about this. I mean, I know, you know I know. I I support Ryder Rips. Uh, I think what he's doing, regardless of you know how the lawsuit is going to end up, I think that he's doing the right thing because there are very many questionable elements in the Board Ape Yacht Club ten thousand, and and I think that you know the 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 further he digs the more he digs into this and the more he reveals what he's digging into the more that it really becomes extremely questionable and i understand he's total hype and he has a personality and it's part of the personality and the way that he has he a very abrasive personality absolutely but i un i understand that but you know you look at some of these board apes and you have to just like you know 
even when they first came out, what were they? They were like, you know, $200, $300. I didn't pick it up because I didn't like the artwork, right? But then That's when you- 100% why I didn't pick it up. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and, and it also kind of like the timing was perfect. Gary V was saying NFTs are going to explode and then they're going to drop off to zero. And, you know, these are the ones that he is in his collection. And then everybody can see everything on Nansen as to who's buying and who has these huge wallets and stuff like that. But, you know, the snake eats the tail in this situation, right? You know, if if Gary V is saying, you know, board ape, board ape, you're board ape, and he's the one who's buying it, you know, then eventually, yes, he's cronies will start buying Bored Ape and then make it super hot. But, you know, marketing can only do so much in the art world, right? If we're really, you know, that's PFPs, that's utility, that's a different segment of the market than fine art. You can't yeah. have, you know, you can't have a top fine art. I'm one of these people who believe that uh, the art market is all about marketing. Absolutely. Well, yes, yes, but only to a very fine segmented audience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Certainly, you yeah. know, you're not so, going to have. If I won, if I won the lottery and I have a billion dollars, if I have six hundred and forty-seven million dollars and walk into a gallery, they'll sell me anything I want. Yeah, but really, that doesn't. You know, it's the same thing with Trump, right? Trump was invited to all of these parties for the, his entire life in New York City, but nobody wanted to fucking talk to him. Right. You can have you can own all the board of yachts, all, all the, you know, B.A.Y.C.s that you want. But, you know, that doesn't make you any more important than you were prior to owning it. Gets you into a lot of nice parties, but that's about the extent of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and the, down, and the downside is, is if, you know, Ryder Rips really does reveal who these guys are and what their affiliations are with white nationalists, that could be a big problem for people who are holding those apes. It can be, but it also might be too big. At this point, it might be too big to fail. Oh, I don't think anything is too big to fail in this world. With cancel culture and everything, no. I think yeah. I think if, if, the, if the information comes out, and I think it's going well, to... I saw that documentary that you, yeah. that you suggested a while, a while back. And my first, I have a, a visceral reaction to Ryder Rips. I don't, right. I had a run in with him. I don't, I don't, I don't personally like him. Right. Um, so, and I don't hide the fact that I don't personally like him. I'm sure you don't fucking care about me either. Right. And that's okay. I would not, you know, I'll still shake his hand and say hello and move on and go get my drink at the bar. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, he has a, a really, he has a fantastic ability to get people's attention. Yep. No doubt about that. Yep. And I'll never take that away from him. He knows how to grab people's attention. Right. Um, so, you know, for me, uh, not owning one really makes it easy for me to ignore him and, and all of this. Right, right. You know? Although the impact will be felt throughout the NFT world. Yeah, I'm sure. So one of the things you were talking about was like the diff earlier, it's the difference between one of one art and and pfps right. and for a while that was there wasn't there was no bifurcation yet when when apes came on board it was all one of one art and then crypto punks and board apes and then you, you know the market started to change and shift and as more people started to come in more people started to go towards the pfp and so you have all of this new collector set what you're seeing now today is this collector set is, in my opinion, I don't want to say getting bored, but let's say that the model is the same for most of these drops and they're looking for something interesting. Um, and now they're coming back into one of one art and they're mm -hmm. rediscovering older artists or artists that have been around like myself. I wouldn't call myself a top tier artist yet. I want to be. I want to be on the level of an X copy. Who doesn't? Uh, I'm still going to do my shit. I'm 100% bullish on myself for the rest of my life. I think that there is a shift now where people are getting a little bit bored of all the crap that's happening in, in this, in the NFT, in the PFP space. Mm -hmm. And they're coming back to one of one art or coming to one of one art mm -hmm. and, and generative art. Oh my God. Generative art is fantastic. Yes. Right. It's in many cases, it's so non-political that it's safe right. for people to invest in. Right. 
Um, and so, yeah, I think market's changing, and I think art is going to save it once again. And I, I, I wrote this probably like four months ago. Art will be you know, the saving grace of the NFT world once again. Right. Um, and I believe that too. Yeah, I, I think we spoke about this. You know, when Brett Malinowski made the announcement that everybody who ha who wants a PFP owns a PFP or can easily get a PFP that they feel represents them, uh, the market's dead, right? The market's oversaturated. And that's yeah. exactly what we saw during the during the bull run was everybody and their mother had a PFP project coming out and were lying about the utility that they were going to produce. You know, U utility was a great marketing term. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Fantastic. Absolutely. Roadmap, I mean, roadmap. The, the amazing thing about Twitter during that period of time was the speed of the marketing, the speed Wonderful. of this change. Yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, talking to clients of mine and, you know, all of a sudden this idea of utility came around where wow. like the month before, like there was nobody, nobody like, when Board Ape Yacht Club launched, there wasn't a road. Was there a roadmap for Board Ape Yacht Club? Oh, yeah. There was they, or there was? They were the innovator. Okay, right. Okay, yeah. right, right, right. So they started the utility concept. Well, they started the roadmap concept. Okay. Well, I, I think maybe other people might have, but they basically blew. They basically did it so well um, that everybody just started copying them. Yeah, but what people don't realize, again, we're so early in the market. You know, having gone through the pre dot coms into the dot coms, mm -hmm. like you know, I was I was trying to explain something to somebody the other day, and I said, you know, look when when the technology was growing for the dot coms, things would change yearly. Yeah. Now things are changing weekly. And during that bull run, well, what you would say daily. Oh. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. And, and, yeah. and the technology that's being used and how it's being utilized and how yeah. the blockchain is growing and the fact that you're all moving over to Tezos, that says a lot because sure. as Ethereum struggles, right? Because if I'm buying a hundred dollar piece of artwork that I now have to spend forty dollars on the gas, or I could buy it over on Tezos, or I could buy it over on Solana, you know, this is the challenge. Like when we look at history, you know, history they say doesn't repeat it rhymes, right? You look at Netscape, and to me, Ethereum, and I've said this over and over and over again, and nobody listens to me, but Ethereum is Netscape. Ethereum is a Netscape was great at the time for what it could do but they couldn't they couldn't manage it and upgrade it fast enough so someone else came in you know before netscape there was web crawler and web crawler was huge and alta vista and all these ask, things that ask, no jeeves. One, ask ask jeeves for microsoft exactly all of these search engines that nobody knows if you were born in 1999 you have no idea what Zero clue. was. You have no idea what web crawler was. No right. concept, and you think everything is run from Google. When you were born, Google was out, and that's it. And so, mm -hmm. when we look at these blockchains, and it's funny because you know I've talked to people that are like, "Our blockchain's going to win," and I'm like, "I don't think there's going to be a definitive winner. I think that there are definitely going to be losers. I think that when you're doing proof of work." Those are definite losers, right? Like I look at Bitcoin and I look at uh, and I look at Ethereum right now, and I see all of these challenges to it—the Tezos and even the Richard Hart stuff. I mean, all of these different, pro you know. Look, it's easy to build a blockchain, right? Everything is open source. I can build a blockchain in a week. Just you know, pull down Ethereum, do another version of it, and and launch it, and you know, have it proof of proof of work. You know, you have to do like you have to move it over to proof of stake. But, you know, we're so, so, so early that fine artwork is always going to be a, an element of blockchain sales and NFTs. Gaming is always going to be an element of the NFT market. But how it's going to be utilized is going to be completely different. Let's talk about Second Realm because yes. Second Realm is kind of where the, the uh, unofficial punks came from, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, so let's Second Realm was my pseudonym. It was my, it was, I was actually anonymous for the first year or so in the space in, uh -huh. in 18, 17, 18, when I was in the chain link world, I was at Second Realm. I was anonymous. 
Uh, and then I became pseud pseudonymous. So mm. I doxed myself, but I was going under the sort of like Lady Gaga, right? That's not her real name. Right. That's her stage name. So Second Realm was my stage name. And then uh, it started to evolve. So I decided at some point in 2021 that I was going to begin moving away from Second Realm as my pseudonym and start showing up in the world as Eric Rhodes. I really saw it as a market advantage because a lot of people were anonymous. A lot of people are pseudonymous. Um to protect their jobs, whatever it is, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, I saw an opportunity here to not only own my, embrace my, the confidence of being Eric again, which mm -hmm. what we did, what we haven't touched on in this is, you know, mental health, my mental health journey, it plays a, a very big role in my NFT experience. It's the primary reason I got into NFTs. So I was doing art again, as a way to cope with crippling anxiety and crippling depression and also like the end of my marriage. And I was going to therapy for the first time ever in 39 years or whatever it was. Art became like a safe space again. And I started practicing, but I didn't want to show it in galleries anywhere, or I didn't want to put it on Instagram where people I knew could see it. And I found this little community of like in the dark corner of the web where people were doing crypto art, where I know nobody that I know is ever going to look there and see my artwork. Yeah. And I get to play with some new technology. Cool. Yeah. Right. And so because of that, I ended up like really just a perfect storm of situations. I, I searched for crypto and art. I'm already doing art. Oh, look, I could put my art in this space. And I've always wanted to practice in public which is basically like learning and growing and accepting criticism uh, publicly by putting your work out there yeah. and um, you grow confidently. And so as I've grown more confident as an artist, I moved away from anonymous to pseudonymous to full on un, you know, doxed Eric P Rhodes from New Jersey, born and raised. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's, let's, that's, take a, let's take a look at this. This is actually your, your kind of coming out. Right? It is. Yeah. Pieces of trash art proof by Second Realm, and this is uh, this is some of your stuff. This is um, tell, tell us had, about it. Yeah, so I had a friend, uh, one of my favorite artists in the space, who's also a friend, is um, Gary Cartledge, aka Troy Fitzpatrick, and um, he was he was commenting how we don't know who's real and who's not real in the space, right. and so I. I sent him a picture of me and my driver's license uh, in a chat to show, to verify that this was actually me, like as a joke. And I, I, in that moment, I realized, well, I wanted to just, I'll just dox myself publicly. And yeah. so that picture there is like a, this, this artwork is a representation of me doxing myself in that moment to him. That's the actual photo that I sent him. And no, well, the, the photo is, is been, has been manipulated right. here. While I, while I didn't mind him having my driver's license, I wasn't putting my real driver's license out on the web. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I am still security conscious. Sure, right? sure, sure. I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that, that I was talking about it with somebody this weekend, you know, what is decentralization? You know, at its core, I think decentralization is is individual sovereignty. That sounds good. And it's like, but what does that actually mean? And what does that actually mean is you are you now have to be responsible for your interactions with centralized authorities. If you're going to if you're going to collect and distribute cryptocurrencies, well, now you have to be your security, your bank, your you have to you know, you're not you're not covered by the FDIC all this stuff right? right so you're there and and now let's take that at a macro scale i have to be aware of what companies i'm inter interacting interfacing with what data of mine is being is being put out there that's my responsibility and it yeah. should be our responsibility and i think that's that's the thing that decentralization and self so individual sovereignty is attempting to teach us not that it should be 100% utopian decentralized but that you need to be responsible as a human in our society today what for 
who you interact with and where you're putting your information out there. I, there are so many people that are going to be unable to do that. They do. They lack the okay. ed- education and the understanding. And that's okay because there are, there are services for them. Like exchanges? No, no, no. I mean like at a society scale, oh. there are services for these people. If you don't want to be, you, if you, fiat will always, in my opinion, will always be available. Right. Um, in some, if you don't want to get involved in the crypto space, fine. You'll have your safe banks. You'll have your organizations where you can, you can be naive and dumb to what's happening around you. But what I blockchain and decentralization has done for some of us is to awaken us from the the social network culture of giving away our shit for free. The idea of the CBDCs, you know, coming in, you know, the government, that's what's going to basically happen is that people that don't understand the difference between owning your own Bitcoin in your ledger wallet or Trezor wallet or, you know, receiving CBDCs from the federal government, they're not going to understand the difference. They're not going to understand what's lacking, what they're Mm -hmm. missing and what they're giving up because they're giving up so much information by getting paid by paid with CBDC that is then tied through the government. And then they can tell you what you can and can't buy. It's a, it's a very complicated area. And I think it's the responsibility of those that do understand to have patience and teach people close to us what it actually means. It's right, very hard. Right. I'll tell you something. You know, I get into this conversation with my family all the time. You know, why are you, why is nobody in my family other than me investing in crypto? Oh, because they're waiting for federal regulation. Well, when there's you, a fear, right? It's a fear, it's a fear right? Yeah. And, and it's understandable. Look, people have lost millions, right? Sure. People have lost, you know, people have also gained money. millions. Uh, absolutely, okay. right? Um, but you have to be educated. It's the same as the dot coms. You're putting your credit card online. You're giving information to a company. Do you know what that company is going to do with that information? Right? right. Wasn't there just something that somebody read through the, oh, right. Well, what are these exchanges? Um, I can't remember which one. One of them that just failed recently. Maybe somebody in the audience knows the answer to this. But when you actually finally went in and you read their policies, you never had ownership of your crypto. You never had control of the money that you're putting yeah. in to buy these cryptos that exchange crashed and now yeah. all those people are out of wallet. it was a custodial wallet right right which is totally different than owning your own crypto and putting it into a hardware wallet so, so let's talk about mental health in the space you know yeah. you recently we both recently. had losses That's- yeah. This, yeah, yeah. this past year, you yeah. lost your father. I lost my grandmother. Yeah. Uh, they were traumatic. I know that you were, you know, what I always say to you is like, look at the timing, how amazing the timing was that mm. you were living in yes. Portland. You divorced your or wife. San Francisco. Oh, sorry. San Francisco. You moved back to New Jersey to yep. be closer to your family for your own personal mental health. Yeah. For my own. Yes. And then your father got sick and yeah. you essentially took care of him for months while he yep. went through chemo Almost and, a year. Yeah. and the chemo basically killed him. Yeah. Yeah. So first thing I'll say is because of NFTs and because of the success it did have in NFTs um, and it saving my own life in terms of giving me a platform to grow, I later become successful enough to run my own business and be there for my dad and take the time off that I need without having to ask a boss or any of that stuff all because of NFTs. And he got to, he got to experience it with me. He would, one of the things I miss is he would send me like texts about NFT and blockchain stuff, like stuff that I would probably most of the time already know about. But I love that he was so interested and invested in, like, my world, you know. And he was young. He was 70. He wasn't – and he was – you know, he he ran his own business, side business for 70 years and was a retired firefighter and, you know, was a EMT instructor. The dude hustled, you know, hustled his entire life. Um, and – it was my rock was my was my go to for personal and business advice and now that's not there 
you know, and that's one of the hardest things. But I've been able to work on my mental health so much over the last two years, three years, really, um, beginning with therapy. Now I have two therapists. I have a traditional family therapist and a sex therapist or a somatic sex educator. Those two, in, along with my, my, I also take uh, Lexapro for, uh, as an antidepressant. Um, so all of that stuff, along with finding myself and this renewed sense of confidence, personal confidence, I walk through the world now and I feel great. You know, I'm the I'm the biggest and the fattest I've ever been in my entire life, and yet I'm the most confident I have ever been in my entire life. You're still a good shape. We do have to say, you know, hey, it's a good shape. I have a good face. I'm not, you know, you have a good face, but I'm saying, like, also, like, I have friends that are your size, also. Yeah. But it's kind of like, you know, all blubbery. You're solid. And I am solid. Really yeah, good. I do, I do have big bones and big muscles. Right. Yes. Right. Um, right. Right. You know, but, but it's, I, I totally agree with you that yeah. you know. I think I think part of it. I think obviously the therapy and the Lexapro and everything like that. And yeah. I've I've been through some some challenges over these last couple of years. I think we've all been through challenges with the pandemic and everything, right? Oh, I used to, but I used to joke with the pandemic. People were like, "How are you doing?" And I'm like, "How how am I doing? This is normal everyday life for me. Like the anxiety levels that you all are feeling. You're in my world now." Right. How am I doing? I feel good. I feel okay. Yeah. Welcome to my world. You know, right, right, right. right. You're, everyone is on the same page right. now. Exactly. I've, I've heard that from other friends of mine also who have, yeah. who also suffer from very, very significant depression. And they said that when the pandemic happened, they were actually relieved that everyone was kind of feeling the same amount of anxiety that they did because they used to walk around and have complete anxiety and not understand why everyone else didn't feel that way. So I thought was, I was broken for most of my life. I, and I would, and I would, I, not that I would, I grew up Catholic, but not that I would pray energy and, and the universe and we can impact our own lives through a positive action. Um, and that begins with positive thought. It's the actions you take and it all starts with putting yourself in a position to do that. When the pandemic hit, for the first time in my life, there were people that understood what crippling anxiety is like, right? And um, and they get it now. Yeah. And and they're like, this is what you felt for 35 years? I'm like, yeah, motherfucker. That's what I felt for 35 years. I didn't know. Right. I thought I was broken for most of it. I'm like, why fix me? Somebody, how come I can't walk into a supermarket and enjoy the shopping experience i gotta sit there and start sweating because there's too many fuck too many people around um or you know or social situations walking into a bar that i don't know where anybody's at and you know try to f now i walk in i feel great now right. i walk in and i feel like i own own places right but right. that's like that's just my my mindset has shifted yes it's taken me a long time to get here yes yes you know? I, yeah i i I totally, you know, I don't really reveal that much about myself, but I went through a, a very traumatic experience and I've come out of it, you know, much more empowered to feel good about myself. Yeah. The size that I'm at, being able to speak to anybody and talk to anybody, regardless of the fact, you know, it's so funny. We, we talk about this all the time, you know, that Myers-Briggs test, right? Yes. So I actually test introvert. Me too. Right. But we're very extroverted people when you get us into well, a learned. certain situation. Yeah. But yeah. that's the, the idea of the introvert is it's not what everybody thinks. It's not that person that's sitting in the corner and can't talk to anybody. Right. It's that person that's actually, while they're talking to you, they do have social anxiety. They, they, they are you know, yeah. concerned about the, what's going on around them, but they're still able to interact with you professionally. The way, the way I've come to understand it for myself is it's how I, and this is maybe oversimplification, but I think I think it, it sort of explains it. Introverts tend to, like energy is sucked out of them the more that they're around people. Right. So I have to step away to regain energy. So like an NFT NYC, even though I live five miles away, I will have a hotel room with a suite so that I can go into that and very close to the venues so that when I'm feeling drained, I go to the suite by myself for an hour, right. recharge, re-energize, right. 
and then come back. Sometimes it's taking a nap. Yeah. But these are the things I've learned about what being an introvert means for me. So, yeah, we are extroverted in appearance. That same kind of element passes on to depression as well, right? We are yeah. actually happy and funny and laughing people. But yeah. internally, you know, we have that depression that's going on in our head. Yeah, like the, I, I, I use visuals too sometimes. So most of my life I felt like I was in clouds, like that depression's like over my face. Now the clouds have lifted. They're still there. Right. I could see. And when it's when it's look, dropping, I can mostly feel yeah. uh, its effects and begin to take care of myself sooner. Although recently, because I've stepped away from uh, being out there in a the world, because I've been feeling depressed and I didn't realize it until. And this is why I have therapists, right? They can reflect things back to you and make you see them. And so I realized I just woke up one day after having a long conversation with my therapist and I was like, Oh fuck you. You are depressed. Okay. Now that I know that what are the small things I can do? Because if I take too much on, it's not going to fix it. But if I make small incremental changes for me, this is what, what works for me. Yeah. I'll begin to cycle out of the depression. Right. Uh, and so I've, I've made those steps. And what I like to do is I like to, treat myself to things that bring me joy for self-care. Like I like manicures and pedicures, right? They make me feel good. Yes. Uh, massages yeah. make me feel good. Going to the chiropractor makes me feel good, right? So doing little things like that will help kickstart now that I've realized that, that I was depressed. But for, you know, it takes, sometimes it takes a while for me to yeah. recognize it. Yeah, Richard says, uh, knowing is half the battle. And that's absolutely true. He says the other half is art. And that, that's very true as well. You know, I think that I went through, I would say, up to my 50s yep. with not really able to identify, do I have anxiety? Am I depressed? But then when I really, really hit a wall, when I really wound up, you know, there was something significantly wrong, I was able to then realized that I had a visceral reaction to depression. I, it, everything was muted. Like it was, like you're saying, like in a cloud, like for me visually, everything, all the colors and everything just looked toned down. It looked mm. almost like in a gradation. And that's, you know, that was like the deepest, darkest part of the depression that I ever had. And the anxiety also, you know, I never really said, oh, I have anxiety until I was around friends who were like, I have anxiety today because of this, this, and this. And I would say, well, I'm definitely concerned about those two. And I have this kind of like gnawing feeling in my chest. And until I actually said, oh, that's anxiety. Like I never really understood what it was. Yeah, like part of part of my therapeutic experience has been learning the difference between anxiety and depression. I I would go through cycles, and it would be like high bouts of anxiety, high bouts of depression. But to me, it was all the same experience. I didn't, I wasn't able, like for years, I didn't know the difference. Interesting. Then you start parsing out, like, oh, I'm anxious has a different feeling in my body, right? Than than depression right. right anxious for me is um very heady depression is is very body driven mm. you know um but these are things and then also def learning the definition like typically anxiety is related to focusing on something in the future where depression is related to focusing on something in the past oh and, interesting and not being present oh that's so interesting i never thought about it that way yeah that's very interesting. Yeah, or at least that's how I've come to understand it for myself. Do you think that the interaction on Twitter enhanced the anxiety and the depression, or do you think that it helped with the anxiety and depression? No, I don't. It, it didn't affect it at all. It doesn't um, affect it at all. So sometimes I see you tweeting at like four a.m. when I've just taken a break to the bathroom from sleeping. Yeah, and I see all your texts, and I'm like, oh wow, he's awake and and. and I'm yeah, like, I'm, I'm awake too, but I'm not tweeting things out. Yeah, I think I've learned to like I can manage Twitter. 
and the interactions I have with people don't affect my anxiety and depression okay. at all. Uh, social media broadly can. Uh, that's why I'm not on Facebook because I really don't care about what you and your kids are doing. Right. Yeah, and the people I do care about are close to me. And I already know. Right. You right. know, like we talk or I see them or, right. you know. Um, right. My I family talk. is on a private chat. We're on yeah, a private we have chat. exactly. Yeah. I have several private chats. Yeah. 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 And, and that's great. And that's fantastic. And, and so I've learned. I haven't I've had I had a Facebook account. I have a Facebook account, but I got off Facebook five years ago. Yeah. Like fully. And I was off Twitter for a long time, mostly just sort of observing. Mm -hmm. But Twitter is such an important part of NFT culture yes. um, that it's business. It's, it's business. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's personal too for me yeah. too. But it's it's like I think also like having the 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 therapy and the work that I've done over the last three years also helps me manage that because I've learned about boundaries. Mm -hmm. Something something I didn't know that I needed to set. Right. Right. For years, I would just let people define what the boundaries are because I think I have to be a good citizen and do what they want. Right. Like right. Uh, these, you know, I didn't know that I could set boundaries for myself. Right. And if people cross over them and that's a violation and maybe it's not their fault, but maybe I didn't set it right. So, right. Like, right. you know, I'm learning all of these new ways to interact with the world. So Twitter um there are boundaries i don't talk politics on twitter anymore mm -hmm. i try to i try not to get into i try not to criticize i try not to complain and i try not to condemn um that really allows for great conversation i'm not always good at it but like having that mindset um can save me a lot of a lot of headache also i don't rely on my home feed i have lists that i use and my lists allow me to just tap to hit the people I know that I'm interested in talking to or listening to and will guarantee that I will get to see if I have my list. Yeah. Because the I, home feed algorithm is terrible. I have to I have to learn how to use lists. I haven't I haven't learned that. Yet. Under under you underrated feature, underused. You know, I have private lists and public lists. The private lists, the public lists are for people that I want to highlight and share and gu guide other people to to follow. So okay. I have pr public lists of glitch artists, of trash artists. Um, eventually, I'm going to do photographers, collage artists I have, right? So I'm putting these lists together. But then I have private lists. And one of them is like, I, I just call it daily. And these are creators that I want to touch on daily. And then I have weekly creators I want I make sure to check in weekly. Um, I will eventually have a monthly, but I just I just haven't gotten there yet. And then you also have private lists that are very specific to who you talk to. That's the daily, weekly, monthly. Oh, yeah. oh interesting. Oh, yeah, wow. and they're broken up into artists and um, I, I don't know what I, I don't think I call it professionals, but like they're like the anybody who's an influencer that I want to just sort of not that I need to interact with them, but if I want to see what they're up to. I will, I will, I'll do that. Sometimes I don't see Jimmy, Jimmy Eats tweets. So I want to make sure I say, I see what he's talking about. Um, and if it's something interesting, I'll, I'll tweet at him, you know, um, he's an OG in the space and I really enjoy his takes. So, and the Twitter algorithm doesn't always make, let me see him. Right. So, and then whale shark, right. Another dude I don't really respect, but I want to see what he's tweeting about. Um, Ryder Rips is and not Pranksy, on that list. Pranksy and, and people Pranksy, like he's that. on that list. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Pranksy used to be uh, way more accessible uh, back in he the day. He got too big. He got too yeah. big. Good, good on him. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Way to, way to grow a fan, uh, brand. Oh, yeah. Absolutely oh. good on him. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So as we wrap this up, nobody yeah. has asked a question yet. I have one final question the t shirt that you're wearing. <laughs> Fuck NFTs. Fuck NFTs. Yes. Why? Why fuck NFTs? No, I wear it ironically. Oh, uh, yes. You have a whole, you have a whole thing in behind you. There's a I whole do. Thing. Where are they? Right, what? right there. Yeah, right there. yeah, yeah. What? So, what? I, so uh, there was this dude on Twitter who um, who tweeted out, and I don't know how I came across it. He tweeted out that he was selling these T-shirts. Fuck NFTs. And uh, forget he 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 didn't like NFTs for whatever reason, okay. something about consumerism, blah blah blah. But they were they were supporting a organization in Oakland that gave 
uh, needles to drug, drug addicts, addicts oh. and, and like, you know, and, and lunches and things of that nature. And I was like, and he was selling them. So 50% would go to the organization. And I guess the other 50% was to cost. Oh, wow. So I bought 32 of them. Oh my goodness. Wow. Oh, yeah. that's a nice investment. Yeah. Well, because I thought it was hilarious that an NFT guy yeah. like myself yeah. would buy 32 fuck NFT shirts <laughs> that I eventually want to, you know, want to, want to give out or sell or something. I'll do maybe, maybe tokenize one day. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. That's so I awesome. wear it. I wear it ironically because it's not really fuck NFTs. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. I, I, I'll have to wear one to next NFT NYC. Oh, yeah. if if my dad, you know, I was I was going to be there, but I couldn't. Right. You know. Uh, you that week. Yeah, and so uh, the next NFT NYC, I'm definitely wearing yeah. this. Well, the good news is, is that you know, since they're not going to NFT their own ticket ticketing, uh, and they have such a shit process uh, in that little printed card. I'm just holding on to it next year, and I'm just planning to walk right in. So I'm not yeah. buying the ticket next year. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Okay, my friend. Look, we could we could talk as we know we could okay. talk for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. This was uh, great. But this has been a great episode. Uh, I really appreciate the interview. This is really fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for great. having me. Thank you everybody for watching. Uh, stay tuned. We'll have other interviews coming up in the next couple of weeks.